Hey, what's up, everybody? I am Tucker. If you don't know me, uh, maybe you recognize me from the baptistry. That's usually what I'm doing on a Sunday night. So I'm not in, you know, shorts and covered in water and stuff, so it may be hard to tell. But that's what I normally do. Uh, Outside of that, I actually lead the Young Adults, which is the post-college group here at The Way. Small plug, if you are 22, uh, graduated, about to graduate, we have a place for you on Sunday mornings and Tuesday nights, and we would love to have you come and join us. If I don't know you at all and you're in college, whatever, I'm going to be down at the the stage with Travis after the service. I would love to meet you. Please come by uh, and say hi. A couple of things about me, just so y'all can kind of get to know who I am just a little bit. Um, I am married, so uh, this is a picture of my family. This is me, Elizabeth, my wife, and our two dogs, Harper and Teddy. We just had our our third anniversary uh, earlier this spring, which is great. Yeah, thank you for clapping for me. I am also surprised I made it three years. Um, (laughs) I've actually been here at the way longer than anybody else on the college staff except for Travis. So I I joined Travis his second semester as a pastor here back in 2016 and just never left. And I was coming for so long, they were finally like, hey, you're spending so much time. Do you need a job or something? And I was like, yeah, I would love a job. And so they gave me a job here, and I've just been here ever since. Um, So to get to know each other just a little, well, not really. I'm not not getting to know y'all. For y'all to get to know me a little better, though, I thought I would provide some interesting facts about uh, myself. So we're going to go in most recently first is what we're going to start with. So uh, me and my wife, like I mentioned, we've been married for three years. We just bought a house. Well, like 20% of a house, you know. To, but, but we are homeowners. I've rented for 11 years, and we are finally homeowners, and it is the best thing. I want you to know this is the most money I've spent on anything in my entire life. Totally worth it. 100% worth it. I don't have to deal with landlords. I don't have to deal with rent. Uh, mortgage, which is more expensive, but no rent. It's great. Buy a house whenever you get a chance. I don't know how long that's going to be, but buy a house when you get a chance. Second interesting thing, uh, by the way, I think these are interesting. You may not. You, you can be the judge of that. But second thing, uh, I'm old, so I am turning 30 in two months, almost to the day, I know. That's not the interesting part. The interesting thing is that as I've gotten older, old things have started to happen to me. I had, this may be TMI, I had my very first kidney stone this year. Thank you. (laughs) Worst experience of my life horrible. I mean, it's terrible. I used to drink Red Bulls before every service coming to the way. That's what that turns into. Not worth it. If you're drinking Red Bulls regularly, stop it. It's the worst thing you could possibly experience ever. You can't even imagine. Third interesting thing about me, factoid, uh, my favorite thing probably in the whole world besides Jesus and my wife, I almost didn't say my wife, but besides Jesus and my wife, uh, snowboarding. I, I love snowboarding. It is, it is, if you've never been, it is the best thing in the entire world. And I say that, what's interesting about this is I say that I had a really terrible accident when I was in high school. I ruptured my spleen because I tried to do a cool trick off a jump, and I'm from Texas, and we should never do that. Uh, I tried to do a cool trick off of a jump, and I ended up landing on my elbow, and somehow that went up under my rib cage and ruptured my spleen. And I was in the ICU for a week recovering. I still think that snowboarding is the best, totally worth the damage, 100% worth the damage. Now, a I, I, little caveat, I haven't been in 11 years, so I think it's totally worth it. I just, I haven't actually <laughs> uh, made the sacrifice necessary to go again, so m- take that with a grain of salt. So why, why do I share? I, I picked those three specific stories for a reason to share with you guys. And what I think is interesting about them, aside from the stories, hopefully you found them fascinating. But what I find interesting about those is that each of them, in each of those stories, there is an answer to the question of, is it worth it? Is, is that worth it? Right? With, with the house, is it worth the thousands and thousands, the unholy amount of money that we had to spend? Yes, totally worth it. I think it is. Red Bull, is it worth the kidney stone that comes later? 
Absolutely not. It's not at all. Don't do it. Snowboarding. Is it, is it worth the, the week in an ICU? Uh, on top of the hundreds of dollars, it is very expensive. That is the other reason I haven't gone snowboarding. It's expensive. Is it worth it? I would say yes, but you look at my life, right, the last 11 years, and I have not once attempted to go snowboarding. I've talked about it a lot. have not once made it onto the mountain to go snowboarding. And I, I think what's interesting, again, each of those are, 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 are an answer, a response to the question of, is it worth it? And tonight, as we dive back into our and close out our series, God, what am I doing here? What we're going to wrestle with as we read through Genesis chapter 22 is, is the question of, is God worth it? Is he really worth it? Now, 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 I believe, and I pray by the end of tonight, you will also agree that God is absolutely worth anything and everything that we could possibly give up. Any price we could pay, God is worth it. But we're going to wrestle with that question as we walk through Genesis chapter 22. And so, if you would, please read with me Genesis 22, starting in verse 1. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son, Isaac. Can we just point out real quickly that God just told him to sacrifice his son, and we see no reaction from Abraham. He's totally fine. He gets up, and he goes first thing in the morning. Is it? Nobody else has a problem with that? Y'all? Okay, okay, just me. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, so he split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father. He replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You, you might be thinking that at this point, Isaac is thinking, I have a bad feeling. Anybody? No? no. I, I, stole, I ripped that off of Travis, so that's you know, credit where credit is due, not my joke. But uh, still good. Anyway, so, so he says, where is the lamb for this burnt offering? Abraham answers him, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. And when they arrived at the place that God had told them about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, here I am. He said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. So today it is said it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, this is the Lord's declaration, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. Abraham went back to his young men and they got up and went together to Beersheba and Abraham settled in Beersheba. So just to recap this story really quickly, what we see really fast is first God says, I'm going to test Abraham. So he goes to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. Abraham Abraham says, okay, and goes up the mountain with his son and no lamb so that he can sacrifice his son. On the way, Abraham's son is wondering, there's no lamb. What are we doing here? Hey, dad, where's the lamb? And he says, don't worry about it. God's going to provide a lamb. It's all going to be fine. To which Isaac says, sure, and keeps going like it's not a problem. 
this should be concerning for somebody here. But Abe, Abraham then ties up Isaac as they get onto the altar, right? Or when they get to the peak and to the altar, he then ties up his son, binds him, starts to actually sacrifice him. And it's in that moment that God says, stop, we're good. I believe you now, you're fine. He then provides a ram and then the ram comes and they sacrifice the ram instead and God blesses Abraham. Weird story, right? Is anybody here thinking like, this is the coolest story I've ever heard in my life? No? That's fine. I am right now as I'm reading it. I haven't felt it up to this point, but right now I'm feeling it. Anyway, so, so, so as we get ready to dive in and, and work through this story, I think something that we do need to address first and foremost is that this, is, this isn't just a weird story. Like God seems to be doing something that is almost out of his character, right? Like he is asking Abraham to kill his son. And if there's anything that we would say this is as far out of God's character as possible, it would be asking somebody to sacrifice their child. Right, like this is, this is not our picture of a good and loving and just and merciful God, right? He's asking him to kill his son on an altar for him. This does not seem like God, and not only does it not seem like God, God himself says, this is, this is something I hate. In Deuteronomy 12, verse 31, he says, For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods, meaning the pagan worshipers, those who worship other gods, for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their God. So, so, so let's, let's just be clear. God, God says, I hate child sacrifice. This is an evil and abominable thing, and yet we have him asking Abraham to do exactly that. Not, not, not only is it out of his character, but, but what is he sacrificing? Why, why Isaac? Like, there are so many things that God could have asked Abraham to sacrifice. An actual lamb would be a good start. Or, or somebody else, a servant, you know, or a, maybe an extended or distant family member, you know, not your son. The, the, the thing about Isaac, though, is not only is he his son, but Isaac is, is a miracle child that was blessed or that was given to Abraham and his wife as a blessing. It's He's not something that should have ever come about. His, Sarah, Abraham's wife, was too old to bear children, and God, in a miracle, places him in her womb, right? Like, he is the culmination of a miracle, and yet here is God saying something that seems out of his character, sacrifice your child, and it's going to be this child that I have created out of a miracle. What, what is happening? Why, why would God do this? I think that one, we need to recognize that this is, this is harsh stuff, and, and we know that, that he ends up not doing it in the end, right? He stops Abraham, but why would he ask him in the first place? Why would he ask him of this of, this, this of him at all? Ooh, my words got twisted. We're going to see the answer to that as we walk through, but, but, but up front, I think we do have a small answer in that this is a test, right? It says in, in verse 1 that God decided to test Abraham. And here, here is the test, because it's not just, will you sacrifice your son? I think what God is actually testing Abraham with is, do you want the promise or the promise giver? Do you want my, my blessings or do you want me who gives you the blessings? Which, which is more important to you? And so, so with that in mind, our first point this evening is that it is free to come to God, but it is not cheap, right? Like, why would God ask something of Abraham? And why would he ask so much? Well, again, it is free to come to God, but it is not cheap. What do I, what do I mean by that? How can, and you may be asking even in the crowd, how can something be free and, and not cheap? How could, how could that, that doesn't make any sense to anybody. Have you ever seen a free dog just giving it away, you know, at the grocery store parking lot? The United that I used to live when, at, next to whenever I rented, they had them all the time. I haven't seen it next to my new house. But let me tell you, a free dog, if, you've, if you haven't adopted a free dog before, I have. That, the yellow dog that was in the picture up on the screen earlier, she was a free dog. That dog cost me thousands and thousands of dollars in the first month I had her. I had to spend so much money on all of these different vet bills and shots and all kinds of stuff. And that doesn't include all of the food that comes after and regular checkups and a dog crate and treats. All that to say, something can absolutely be free and be costly at the same time. And we actually see that, I think, in this story. A few chapters back in, in Genesis 15, God makes this covenant with Abraham. And then 
when he makes it, when he establishes it, he puts the weight of that covenant on himself. He, he bears the weight of it. it. It's the same thing that we see in Christ, right? Like for those of us that, that are in Christ, we believe, we know that the gift of salvation in Christ, it is truly that. It is a gift. It is free. There's nothing we could possibly do to earn it or buy it. It is a gift. And yet, I think what we need to recognize is that being in Christ it also costs us. It is a costly thing. Why? Because God desires every bit of our heart. You see, God tests Abraham to see if he will trust him with his promised child, to see if he values God even more than this precious son. Verse 12 says, I now know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son. God desires every bit of our heart. And so the call for us is to love God more than what he gives us, to, to, to love him more really than anything, but, but, but more than even the good things, the blessings that he gives us. Isaac, again, he is the promised child, the blessing to Abraham and his wife in their old age. And, and more than that, he's also going to be what all of the other promises that God has made to Abraham, they're all going to come through Isaac. And yet, God is asking Abraham if he truly loves him more than Isaac, more than what he gives him. Again, we are called to love God over and above every other person and thing, including ourselves. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. This idea of being crucified with Christ, it's the idea that, that who we are, everything that we value, that, that, that none of it matters when it is compared to Christ. None of it matters. In, in, in preparing this, this sermon, there was a, a story that actually came to mind. Me and a few other people from this church and actually some of the other college students in this room, we went on a trip to Utah uh, to go and to share the gospel with Mormons uh, on, on a college campus up north. And while we were there, we went through a bunch of different training and stuff like that. And one of the things that, that Jason, the guy who was leading our, our, our group, said uh, is that there, there are the, like five different stages uh, that a Mormon can find themselves in as we are trying to share the gospel with them. And the last one, the last one that happens before they come to Christ, he said it's called counting the cost. Because for anybody who is going to leave the Mormon church and accept Christ as their Savior, anybody who's going to, to step out of that and into the, the church, the church, there's a moment where they have to realize and weigh the cost of, if I do this, it might mean that I lose everything. It might mean that every relationship I've ever known, it might mean my family even cuts me off. For sure the people in my temple, but it might cost me everything. And there was a girl, actually, uh, who was a part of this church plant called Mosaic while we were up there. And, and while uh, it was after this training, but she was sharing about how she had gone through exactly that. That, that, that she had been called by Christ out of the Mormon faith and into Christianity. And, and she, as she began to wrestle with, I know that this is who Jesus is, but I'm seeing what it will cost me if I choose to follow him. She, she ended up making that decision and, and leaving everything behind. And the thing is, is that it did cost her everything. Her parents cut her off. The, all of those relationships, everything that she had in her old life, she said it was gone. And somebody in our group asked, as, as we were sitting there and hearing her share all of this stuff, we just, they asked, was it worth it? And she said, absolutely. This, this, was, this was the best decision I could have ever made. Even knowing, and she was like crying, talking about the pain that she experienced in, in all of that stuff that she left behind. But what she said was that it was absolutely worth it. And so the question for us is, is God worth the cost for us? Is God worth the cost of that person that you are dating that doesn't love Jesus or is not following him? Is, is, is God worth the cost of that lucrative career, that degree that you're pursuing, or, or even the dream of being a missionary somewhere special? Like, is, is God more important to you than those things? Is he worth that cost? Is he worth the cost of your social status, the, the fun party that all of your friends will be at, all of the things that you would rather be doing or giving up your time and energy to other than him? Is God worth giving up each and every one of those things? The truth is, is that 
a long time ago, I actually answered no to that question. So I mentioned that I've been at The Way since 2016. I actually came about two years prior to that under the previous college pastor. The, it wasn't The Way. It was called Overflow. And I, I attended as a college student, you know, my, my freshman, sophomore year of, of college. And while I was here and hearing the gospel, there came a moment when, when I felt this question be asked of me. And I felt to, I began to see God and feel him press this question in, am, am I worth giving up all of those other things for? And, and my answer was no. I decided that while I did want God and I did believe in Jesus, I, I also wanted to be in control of my life. I wanted to go my own way. I wanted to continue to hold on to the pleasures that, that I was finding in the world. I wanted to, to, to stay in all of the things that I thought were making me happy and leading me to a good place. I said no to God, and I walked away because I wanted those things more. And, and that's clearly not the end of my story, and we're going to come back to that here in a second. But, but I think for each of us, we need to ask the question of, where does God fall in my list of priorities? Do, do you even know where he's at? in your list of priorities. The interesting thing, I didn't know this until we started preparing for this, but the interesting thing about the word priority is that there was not a plural version of that word up until 100 years ago. Meaning 100 years ago, the word, um, ooh, I almost lost it, the word priorities did not exist, was not a word. Why? Because, because only one thing could be your priority. There could only be one priority. Everything else was not your priority. There was one priority. And I think it's the same with God. If God is not your first thing, then he isn't a priority because he isn't the priority of your life. And, and, and there's no other option. Partial surrender with God, giving up some and holding on to everything else, that is, that is not an option for us as believers. It is all or nothing. It is total surrender or not at all. I think this is the wrestling that we're presented with in this, in this passage. And so a, a follow-up question for us maybe and for you in the crowd may be, how do I know if he's my priority? How do I know if God is actually number one? Because I like God and I know he's up there, but, but how do I know if he is actually number one? Or, or if there is something else in between me and him, how do I know what that thing is? How, can I, how do I figure it out? Well, will you look at the test. The, the, the second point tonight is that tests reveal and refine. Like It's why Abraham or why God chooses to test Abraham is to reveal these things, right? So I, I have a picture. If you'll put up the, uh, the metal throw that up there. So this, this is actually aluminum. I tried to find a really good picture of uh, silver or iron. Impossible to find. Couldn't do it. I don't know. I tried for hours. Couldn't do it. This is aluminum. And, and, and so aluminum in its raw form, and this is true for any metal, is that it's, it's never pure, right? There's, there's always impurities that are mixed in. There are other minerals and, and things that are mixed into it. And, and the only way to even see those things, but, but the only way to remove them is to bring it up to a high temperature and it's begin to melt the metal. And once the metal, once the actual metal, so aluminum, silver, iron, whatever, once it begins to melt, all of those impurities, they, they actually melt faster first. And so, so they, as they begin to melt, they begin to separate out. Does that make sense? And so, so in the testing, that's actually the process that we're seeing. What, what happens with the metal in that, that picture was, again, aluminum. And, and all of the actual aluminum was, was melting to the bottom. And everything that was at the top, everything that you could see, everything that guy was scooping out, it was the impurities. Because it's only in the testing that those things can be found. It's only in the, in the heat of that process that those things are going to be made clear. And so God asks Abraham to do something, again, incredibly difficult. He tests him, and yet Abraham's response is to get up and to go. I joked earlier about how I can't believe that he did this, but, but that is an incredible show of faith that Abraham, he got up and he went. And when Isaac asks him about the lamb, Abraham responds, God will provide. Hebrews 11, uh, verse 19, it, it, it's talking about Abraham in this moment. And what it says is he considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. God, God is so powerful. And, and the thing is, is that Abraham, Abraham sees that. He's, he's asking something incredibly difficult of Abraham. And yet, 
Abraham, because he trusts God, because he believes that I I don't know how you're going to do this. He doesn't seem to think in this moment that God is going to spare his son, but he says, even if he doesn't, I believe that God is still going to come through. I believe that he is not done. I know that he is trustworthy. And so what I think we see in this is that Abraham knows that what really matters, more than Isaac, more than the promises, more than the blessings, it is God himself. You only lay down something if you want something more, right? Like the only reason that that Abraham would ever let go of his son is if what he thought he was grabbing onto was more important. Why would he ever let go of his blessed son for anything less than that? And so the test proves that Abraham feared God and desired him above all else, that he trusted God enough to give up the blessings that, that he had given him and that God had blessed him. As Abraham does it, we read at the end of this passage, God blesses him for it. If you look at verse 16, it says, By myself I have sworn, this is the Lord's declaration, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. Again, you only lay down something if you want something more. And, and this test proves that, that while blessing came out of this, Abraham, Abraham did it because he trusted in God. And, and that trust was not misplaced. So back to this question of, of where does God rank in your list of priorities? Is God really your priority or, or is it something else? And if it's something else, what is that thing? How do we, how do we answer that question? Again, it, it's look at how you've done in the testing. God, God has been testing you. This, this isn't a one-time event that God does with Abraham. It's something that he does with us. What, what, we all have moments where God is asking us to let go of something, to trust him with something, to give something up for him. How do we know if God is actually our priority? We look at how we have done in those moments of testing. We look at the moments that we have said no to God for something else. We look at the the things that we have refused to let go of for God. We look at the things that we are afraid of letting go of. We look at the things that we, we know will hurt if we let go of them. Those are the things that, that we are putting in God's place as priority. And so the the question for you is, do you want God more than those things? Whatever it is that came to mind, whatever it is that you have said no to God for, whatever it is you have refused to let go of for God, whatever that thing is, do you want God more? Do you actually believe that God is better than those things? Because I I believe that, and I know it to be true, and, and I think it's easy to say, but do you actually believe that? Do you believe that he is better than those things? Do you believe that he is worth giving up all of those things for? And as we wrestle with the answer to that question, I think what we need to ask is simply, what what is our Isaac? What is your Isaac? The thing is, is that we all have an Isaac. Each and every one of us, we have something that we try to put into that place of priority that should be God's. We each have something. What is yours? Side note, this is metaphorical. If your name is Isaac, we love you. We're not going to sacrifice you at the end of the service. I'm glad I saw nobody run out. That's great. Stick around. If you're dating an Isaac, this isn't necessarily a sign that you need to break up with him. But I don't know. I'll leave that up to God. All that to be said, we each have an Isaac. We each have an idol, which is exactly what this is, something that, that, that takes this place. You look back at, at verse 2. And the request that God makes of Abraham, and what he says is, take your son, your only son, whom you love. And I think a point that needs to be made here is that Isaac isn't a bad guy, right? Like, like Isaac is innocent in this. He's, he's a, a kid. He hasn't done something that God is punishing him for in this moment. And on top of that, again, back to the idea of him being a problem, like he is a blessing that God has given Abraham. He's not, a, he's not a bad thing. I think often what we think of when we think of idols and things that we need to remove and let go of for God, we think of the sin that's in our lives, right? Like we think of the, the things that are openly in opposition to what God is calling each of us to. The thing is, is I think that the harder idols to both notice and the harder ones to let go of are the ones that, that aren't, they're not bad things, they're good things, they just, they aren't God. 
for, for Abraham. I think that's why God tests him with Isaac. Isaac isn't a, a sin that Abraham is committing or anything like that, but, but he is what is most precious to him. If you were to ask me in this moment, what, what is my Isaac? I, I, easy answer is my wife. I love her. She is a good thing. She is a blessing to me. But if I am not careful, she, it's so easy for me to place her in that position of priority over and above God. And there have been many, many other things over the course of my life, including my future, my, my desires, and, and my pride, and my shame, all these different things that, that, that I, have, I have allowed to take that place. But the question is, what is that for you this evening? Because it, 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 it may be sin, but, but, but it may be something good in your life that you're just holding on to more tightly than God. What is it for you that you are looking to provide for you something or meet your needs instead of God? What are you trusting in other than him? What is your idol? Is it a person, a relationship, a job, a career, or grades that are a specific GPA? What, what is that thing for you? And then the follow-up is that to that is, are you willing to lay it down for him? Because the question becomes, what if I don't want to lay this thing down? What if, what, what, what if I don't want to let go of this thing? I, I like God, and he's great, and I want to love him, but I, I like this thing a lot, and I don't want to let it go. I think that there are two simple answers to this question. The first is that you will miss out on the wonderful things that God has for you, the better things that God has has for you. You will miss out on his plans for your life. God increases Abraham's blessing when Abraham trusts him. When we refuse to let go, we miss out on that. But the, the second is that your soul will get sick. Whatever that thing is that, that, that you don't want to let go of, that thing that you love, even if it is a great thing, if you hold on to it tighter than you hold on to God, your soul will will be worse for it. And if you are holding on to it more tightly than you are holding on to God, eventually you will crush that thing. That relationship that you're holding on to, you will destroy it. It will poison you, whatever that thing is. And so, so instead, what we must know, what we must do is we must trust that he has a reason to ask us to give up this thing. And we must remember, we must trust that he has something better. When we finally give God our Isaac, we see that God wants something for us more than he wants something from us. And so tonight, we have spent most of this evening talking about what we need to give up for God. And I think God is calling each of us to do exactly that with something tonight. There is something I pray that was laid on your heart, something that you feel conviction of, something that God is asking you to let go of. But the really beautiful thing about this passage is that in the end, it's actually not about what we need to give up. This passage is actually about what God gives. The end of this story in verse 14, Abraham calls the place, he names the place, the, the mountain where the Lord provides. And, and in the Hebrew, it is, it is Jehovah Jireh, which again means the Lord will provide. And I think that the, the challenge, the question from this evening is simply, God is asking you, will you trust me to provide? Whatever needs you are looking for in other things, whatever, whatever it is that, I, I am, that you are holding on to, will you trust that I, that God, will provide instead? We look at this passage, and there's just a couple of things I want to point out as we close. The first is the ram caught in a thicket. We look at this story, right, and we see that, actually, I'm going to switch that up. The first thing <laughs> that we're going to look at, Genesis 22, verse 2, the very beginning again of this passage, God says, your only son, Isaac, your one and your only son, Isaac. And if we flip over real quickly to John 3.16, it says, 
Hopefully you're familiar with this. It says, For God so loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The interesting thing is that in both of these passages, the word for only, so these are two different languages, right? The, the first in Genesis is yakid, which means alone, only, unique. It's singular. It, it doesn't just mean only. It means specific. Because if you remember, Remember, Isaac is not Abraham's only son. Ishmael is actually his firstborn out of wedlock, all this stuff. The point is that Isaac is the unique son. He is the one through whom all of these blessings will come. The interesting thing is that this same word is only used about a dozen times, both in Yaqid and this second word in Greek, which is monogenes. I almost said monogenes. That's wrong. Monogenes. Say it with me. Monogenes. That was good enough, you know. I heard a monogenes in there somewhere. But it, again, it means unique. So these, these two words, and, and it's used a couple of times referring to Isaac and referring to Jesus. And what they mean, and I think that what we're meant to take away is that there is something unique about Isaac. And, and it's meant to draw our attention to this picture of monogenes, which is Jesus, God's only his unique, his, his specific and only son. And, 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 and if the connection to Christ isn't clear enough, we now look at the ram that is caught. In verse 13, it says, Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. God tests Abraham, right, and, and relents. But, but what God does not do is relent against his own son. You see, when, when, when Abraham was in need of a sacrifice, what he did was provide a ram. He spared his son Isaac and brings a ram for the sacrifice. And what he does for you and I is he brings Jesus. There is so much more. The thicket is tied to the image of the cross that Jesus is sacrificed on. This, this picture of a ram that God provides, it is, it is meant to point us to Jesus. Because the thing, again, is it's not about what we are meant to give up. It is what God gives God does not, he, he, he relents against Abraham. He does not have him follow through with killing his son, but he does not relent against his one and only son. This is why God sent his monogenes, his one and only unique son to die on a cross, to be the substitute for us, to pay for our sins so that if we believe in him, we can come to him and be with him for eternity. We hold back out of fear. We hold on to what we have because we aren't sure that what we are going to receive in turn from God is really worth what we are giving up. But the beautiful truth is that Jesus instead thinks that you are worth dying for. God sees you and he sees someone worth giving up everything for. So the, the, the question at the beginning of this is, is God worth it? He has proven not just through his word, but in my life that he is worth it. Everything that I have been given or everything that I have given up for him has been worth the loss because of what I have gained in him. And so if you are in the room tonight, and this is the first thing that you've ever heard, or maybe you are wrestling with whatever this thing is that, that, that you are holding on to and wondering maybe or fighting with the question of, is God worth giving up this thing for? I want you to know that this is where I was. I mentioned that I left the way back before it was the way, I, and really in that moment what I did is I turned away from God. I walked away from him. And it was because my life that was full of sin, I liked it more it was, it was because I wanted to hold on to everything that I had, but in turn, I was broken. And when I turned back to God and, and he, he began to show me that letting go of these things, he offered me many chances, but when he offered me the chance again to let go of these things, what I began to see is that God began to move not just in my life and point me in a new direction, but he began to work in my heart. The sex that I thought would lead to uh, or would heal my, my loneliness, the drugs and the alcohol that I thought would heal or numb my pain, the anger and bitterness that I was holding on to that I thought would protect me and be a shield for me, the future plans that I thought would fulfill me and make something of me, what I found when I began to give those things to God, I began to see that real love, real healing, and real joy are what he is giving in return. And so for you tonight, if you are wondering if it is worth the cost, I just want you to hear that it is. 
It is worth the cost. He is worth anything and everything you could possibly pay for him. It will cost you, but I promise you that it is worth it. All you have to do is come to him, and it is free. With that, let me, let me pray for us as we go back into a time of worship. God, we thank you that you are a good and a loving God who cares for us, God. We thank you that, that, God, it's not about what we have to give up, God, but it is about what you have given for us. I pray that you would just help us to see, God, the truth of your sacrifice for us tonight.